Yeah. Hey, everybody. We are live on YouTube right now, and we have a new camera and a new microphone. We're going to go live on TikTok and live on Instagram in just a <laughs> moment. So let's try to see if we can get that. We're going to get out. everything set up, and then it's all going to come down. But you know what the good news is? <clears throat> yeah. We've got our coffee. Uh, it is snowing outside. It is absolutely beautiful. That's excellent. I'm going to see if I can set this up somewhere. Do you want to just rest it on that? I think that's not going to work. I think that'll fall. We need like an extra stand. <laughs> Does that work? It's a lot of great camera angles. I, know. I love it. Love it. Okay, go live. That should be okay. Is it better with this closed? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, this is wonderful. I'm going to go live right now on Instagram as well. <laughs> Checking connection. Let's see. If, uh, yeah, there we are. We are now live on three <laughs> devices. We are live on YouTube. We are live on TikTok. And we are live on Instagram. And live in this car. That's kind of, yeah, we're still <laughs> barely breathing. It's it's like the scene in Star Wars where Rey mm. goes into the cave and she sees all those mirror images of herself, herself. refracted. That's what we're living right now. It's like I we see three three images of ourselves. Three of ourselves. Exactly. So we're gonna have to divide our attention between Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Uh, we do have a new camera and a webcam and a new yeah, microphone. microphone for YouTube because we know that the sound and the video quality has not been ideal. So hopefully this is going to be a little bit better. Yeah. And YouTube is not going to crash on us like it has previously. Yeah. And we've got backups. I wonder where we want to put this guy so that they can see you. I need to see me. Well, be nice. This is what the... I look like. Yeah. There you Hi. go. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time today, welcome. Welcome to our learning community. Yes. We're very pleased to have you. We yes. have students from around the world joining in, pretty much every single country I can think of. Yeah, absolutely, because I had a wonderful week of messaging many of you on Instagram and learning about where you're from and checking your country code and hopefully <laughs> getting you invited to Clubhouse. So thank you, everyone who gave us invites, everyone who passed on invites, everyone who invited friends. We're really, really excited about this. So thank you guys very much. It really means a lot to us that you're with us for this. <laughs> yeah, Jen Lane's referring to the fact that we're going to be having our very first Clubhouse discussion or seminar right after this class. Mm -hmm. So as soon as this class ends, we're going to make our way. It's like <laughs> you go to another classroom, you grab a coffee. We're going to make our way to the Clubhouse app mm -hmm. where we're going to have a live audio seminar to discuss everything that was discussed in this class. Okay, if you're joining us for the very first time, mm -hmm. this class is part of a lecture series on philosophy. But, my dear friends, it is not on philosophy, it is in philosophy. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that we are teaching this class in a dialectical fashion. Now, what is dialectics? We could do a whole class on this, <laughs> but basically, there is if we have 12 classes in one, uh, one series, mm -hmm. there is no beginning point and no ending point. In other words, if this is your very first class, then you are at the exact right point. This is a great starting point and you can weave your way through the series mm -hmm. however you like. We've saved them on YouTube. We've saved them on Instagram. Yeah. Um, every class, however, is standalone. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is zero knowledge required. I try to teach these classes <laughs> in a way that they're both for experts and Yes. Um, Jenaline, who is sitting next to me, um, has joined us to participate in the role of the interlocutor, yes. which means that she gets to interrupt, she gets to break the tempo down, <laughs> ask questions that a yes. non-philosopher would ask, yes. and Jenaline is the vital ingredient to this, because <laughs> I can't do this without Jenaline here, so thank you for being here with us, and uh, I think we should just sort of go right in. Yeah, let's jump right in. Jump I right know in. We, I know you've got your coffee set up and and all the networks seem to be working. Everything is working. This is very exciting. That's pretty good. Yeah, okay. That's wonderful. Um, so yeah. I just want to warn you for a moment. This class <laughs> on Marx and Marxism, <laughs> uh, 
one of the things that I like to do in the classes is I'll say I'm going to teach on something and then I never actually mention the name. <laughs> and that's kind of what this class is going to be. It's going to be unlike any class you've ever taken on Marxism, I promise you, because I'm not going to teach on Marx. I'm not going to give you a summary of Marx or Marxism. I'm going to lead us on a merry dance. <laughs> a Hegelian Bacchanalian world <laughs> in which the ideas are going to be thrown around uh -huh. and at the end of it I hope that like Marx will pop into your head like <laughs> oh yeah of course Marx yes and in particular the relationship between idealism and materialism it's sort of like like creating all of the the negative space you know if you watch someone draw something and you watch what they're drawing not realizing yeah. that they're drawing the negative space and then suddenly the form appears so we're trying to draw the negative space in a way hence the if you really love nothing and yeah hopefully a picture will emerge yeah Jenlin's referring to the title of the series which is if you really love nothing <laughs> and everything we talk about in this hour mm -hmm. is going to be an echo or a reference or a meta gag to everything we've talked about in the other classes like literally there are easter eggs buried throughout <laughs> so what we're going to cover today is going to range all the way from dwarves and lord of the rings to dostoevsky <laughs> to masturbation <laughs> to, <laughs> to or auto eroticism <laughs> to the Lacanian Parisian <laughs> veil. We're going to have everything. We're going to have some Zizek. We're going to have Hegel. And the idea is that by the end of it, hopefully, Marx will just sort of spontaneously <laughs> pop up in your head as like, oh yeah, of course, this is why Marx. Um, I'm going to do it without jargon if I can. Okay, so we are going to start right now. Hold on to your butts, basically. <laughs> okay, so I was uh, reading Dostoevsky the other day, uh -huh. and it was the Brothers Karamazov. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's at least two passages that I want to reference here mm. um, that I really enjoy. So one of the figures in Brothers Karamazov is the elderly patrician father figure who's a drunk, and he's abusive towards women, mm -hmm. and he's sort of like this... this terrible <laughs> character sort of this like right. trump like figure mm -hmm. except he doesn't have the he doesn't have the ambition that trump mm. has he doesn't have the balls that trump has <laughs> like in a way like he's very much happy just being at home and stewing and feeling superior to everybody else right. and he has this rant because a lot of the rants from this father figure the rants are about religion mm. because as he grows older he starts worrying about what happens after you die Right. And he's aware of the fact that there is a hell and that you go to hell if you're a bad person. He knows he's a bad person. He doesn't expect anything. Mm -hmm. And so he has an elaborate rant about why he can disprove the existence of hell mm. from a materialist perspective. Mm -hmm. And he says, what is hell? Well, hell is a place that the devil devils mm -hmm. drag you down into with hooks. Mm -hmm. And he says, there's this whole hook business. <laughs> If you have hooks, then they have to make the hooks. So who makes the hooks in hell? Is there a factory in hell in which hooks are produced to drag me into hell? Is there a ceiling in that factory? Does that mean that there's is there a whole production line? Is there a production line? Does that mean that there's um, employees? Yeah, employees, a whole system. Like what is hell if if it has hooks? He gets really hung up on the idea of hooks. Yeah, exactly. And then he says, so either mm -hmm. there must be a hell that has like this whole world, the production line of hooks, a ceiling, right. et cetera, or <laughs> the hooks are somehow made just for me. Mm. And he sort of ends on that. He says like, I can't believe in this idea of hooks that were made just for me. Mm. And that's something that I want to keep in mind today a little bit. This idea of, of a material thing being made just for you. Mm. Because, of course, the immediate reference here for those who have studied literature, literature is Kafka's Before the Law hmm. and the, the miniature story of Before the Law. Because if Dostoevsky says that oh, means that the hooks are there just for you, it's almost like Dostoevsky and said, I'm going to write that story <laughs> because, of course, the punch of Before the Law mm -hmm. is the guardian telling the man this door, mm -hmm. this gate was created just for you. Mm -hmm. And so I want to very briefly rehash what the Kafka before the law story is in case you haven't come across yes. this. 
So the basic premise is that we have the the male protagonist uh -huh. who finds himself in front of a gate. It's a get through that gate to meet the master who is in the mansion behind it. Right. Uh, however, the gate is closed. The mm -hmm. gate is barred. He can't get through. And so he's stuck. Mm -hmm. He's basically stuck standing in front of the gate. It's a little bit like waiting for Godot mm -hmm. kind of situation, sort of absurdist apocalyptic landscape <laughs> he's waiting in front of the gate mm -hmm. and he says eventually the master will let me in right and by the end of it mm -hmm. he's spent his whole life waiting in front of the gate mm -hmm. futilely <laughs> sort of wondering why this is his predicament mm -hmm. and then as he is about to die the guardian of the gate walks up to him and whispers in his ear right before he passes away my friend this gate was built just for you. And what's great about this is that gate is the gate to hell. That gate is the hook that drags you into <laughs> hell. And the mistake that the father figure makes in Dostoevsky uh -huh. is that he thinks hell is a place right. without realizing that the hook is hell. The material idealist thing mm -hmm. that was made just for you, your own personal hell, your own crux to bear, mm -hmm. that is what hell is. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if, and I said this before, it's almost as if Kafka read Dostoevsky and then said, I'm going to write this myself. Right. It's that line, hooks must have been made just for me. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very haunting theme that, that we're going to carry through in this whole class. Like the theme of, what does it mean to realize that something that you thought was an external barrier was made just for you? And there's something very uncanny about that, right? Because you've probably never seen this, but in the 1970s, there was a horror movie. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it called? Revenge of the Body Snatchers mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. And you can look it up on YouTube. And the, the premise is that like aliens have taken over people's bodies on Earth. So the body functions as a host. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they're slowly taking over other people. Mm -hmm. And the way they don't really speak anymore, they're just sort of like empty vessels. And what they do is that they like point their finger at you and they go like, oh, <laughs> they're like really scary zombies. <laughs> and there's this realization for the main character that all these people who are just going through their daily lives, people who he doesn't know, strangers, are all out to get him. Yes. And there's that uncanny realization at the end of the movie where suddenly everybody who's just walking around their day-to-day -day life, mm -hmm. they turn to him and they want him. Mm -hmm. And so this is, of course, the, the, the horror, the horrific inversion of what society is. Mm -hmm. Because we think, here's the thing, there's a maxim you may know from if you've lived in a city, that the best place to be anonymous mm -hmm. is to be in a city. The best way to be lost is to be lost in a crowd. The best way to be alone is to be alone amongst a million other people. Like mm -hmm. people are more lonely in cities than they are in small communities. Mm -hmm. And so what the revenge of the body snatchers does is it basically tilts that on its head and says, what if everybody around you, instead of being unaware of your presence, suddenly focused all their attention on your presence? Mm -hmm. That would of course be like a hellish moment. That would <laughs> that would be the hooks dragging you into hell. Right. It's that if everybody suddenly stopped mm -hmm. and they turned around mm -hmm. and they pointed at you and they said, you. Yeah. And that's sort of like the Don Giovanni being dragged into hell moment. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I think that I'm an individual ethical agent working and playing and having sex in a world. Having choice having choice and then suddenly you realize like everything around you was built to punish you right as it were the book <clears throat> and so this idea that what you think is an external reality mm -hmm. could actually be the conditions of your punishment is to me a very haunting idea mm -hmm. and of course many conceptions of hell are precisely that you wouldn't realize that you're dead right. you would for example imagine that you wake up and every day you're reliving the worst day of your life. Like, I f feel like nobody's ever asked, like, why isn't the Matrix? Like, why isn't that just, like, isn't that just hell for Neo? Yeah. Right? Everyone just talks about it being a virtual reality or mm -hmm. a real reality or... 
Sorry, I didn't go very far. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, that's great. It's, no, it's, it's a good thought. It'd be fun to do like a whole Matrix yeah. bit. And Zizek did a whole Desert of mm-hmm. the Real yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, thanks for breaking it down a bit, though, because like mm-hmm. <clears throat> we want to. It, we don't want to get to a point where the riffs can't be distinguished from the non riffs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> from the content. Yes. So the point that I'm trying to make here between Dostoevsky's idea <clears throat> of... Well, there's the notion of the personalized, <clears throat> right? The notion of what you think is you're just being anonymous is suddenly becoming something that is specifically tailor-made for you. That's the first notion. Yes, but, but it's, this- it's a little bit... A little bit easier than that, even. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at here mm-hmm. is that we have repetition of themes. For Dostoevsky, it's the idea of the material hooks. Right. He says, "I can believe in hell, but the part that I get hung up on is the idea of the physical hooks. Mm-hmm. Where are these hooks made?" Right. For Kafka, then we have the radicalization of that idea, mm-hmm. which is if there is a gate to hell. Maybe hell isn't a place. Hell is the gate it's itself. Gate, right. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So we set up uh, barriers. Right. For Dostoevsky, the devil mm-hmm. is a material barrier for proving the existence of hell. Mm-hmm. And for Kafka, the physical barrier, the literal barrier of the gate, mm-hmm. is hell itself. Right. And so what we have here is the introduction of the imaginary element mm-hmm. in the material. Okay. Because both the hook and the gate are material, right? right? Mm-hmm. And, and they're specifically like material objects that don't serve any purpose. Like they're, they're like a crack in the edifice mm-hmm. of, the, of, of hell, right. as it were. Yeah. So I just want you to briefly think about like the imaginary and the material. material. And so it's all gonna, <laughs> all these ideas are gonna slowly germinate and then hopefully they'll like pop into your mind later. <clears throat> so if you were with us last week, we had an extended riff on virginity. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. On the nature of virginity and to what extent virginity is also a social construct. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking more about virginity this week. Mm-hmm. And which is not, I mean, <laughs> only philosophers get to say things like, I was thinking about virginity this week. I didn't Google it, that's for sure. And uh, so, and I, oh, your, your phone's going to die. <laughs> Do you want to plug, plug it in? TikTok, I'm sorry. No, you should plug it in. Okay. I don't think we'll drain battery. Jenlene really needs a new phone. We need to like crowdsource uh, a new no, phone for Jenlene. No, no, I just, this is I hate buying Jen-Aline's new phone. things. It's a great phone. It's a great phone, but it has like no battery. Bear with us, there might be some loud music. Uh, is this going to work? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Thanks for staying with us. Sorry. Whoa. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. people on YouTube. Okay. Thanks, people on TikTok. Thank you, people on Instagram. <laughs> okay, so I've been thinking a lot about virginity this week, about virginity. Yeah. And in particular, um, so we were talking about, like, is virginity a social construct? Right. That's something that came up in our last uh-huh. class. Right. And one of the things that, that I came across is uh-huh. in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's <laughs> writing, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he actually talks exactly... Oh, it's not. No, it's okay. Is it, is it it's loading? Charging. Okay. I think so. All right, we'll see. I it's keep interrupting. Just... Technology. Yeah, just that's hold good. It for a bit. No, you don't. That's good. <laughs> so, in Jean Jacques Rousseau's writing, yes, he actually writes about this, where he he talks about virginity existing both in what he calls like an ideal state and a material state, mm, mm-hmm. and the ideal state is the imaginary one. The, the value and the worth of virginity as being something to be cherished or protected or as something that exists within the social relations of um, marriage. Because, right. of course, marriage contracts are about the transfer of possessions. Right. And so the woman's virginity, as sexist as it is, becomes a symbolic placeholder for the idea of property you know that that is actually an elective surgery i studied anthropology an elective surgery that women have to re- restore restore right? their virginity which just seems like the most is it a hymen is that what it's called i think so a hymen okay i think so it's like the anyway, yeah physical barrier, barrier that can be broken yeah right um and so what russo writes about 
Wow, this is so hard to set up. I'm going to let you hold it for a moment. Yeah. Do you mind setting up? Okay, so what Russo talks about, essentially, is he says there's a material and an ideal aspect to virginity. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's the we're aware that virginity is a construct. Virginity yeah. is something that exists. Like, it exists in nature, but it doesn't exist with any purpose. Right. Jelly, that's not going to work. Sorry. Okay, everybody, I'm really sorry. We're having some technical issues here. I'm going to set this up here. That'll be just fine. Uh, after this, we're going to go out and buy. No, we're going to go and buy. Oh, we oh. lost this. Oh, no. Okay, Where's we're still online. I've been badgering. Generally, I'm saying we need another one of these holsters. Okay. okay, so nobody on TikTok can see my face, but that's fine. That's just how it's going to be. Mm hmm Okay, finally back to virginity. Okay. <laughs> and so a real part of virginity and an imaginary part of virginity. Right. And the idea being that they need each other in a sense. Like mm -hmm. there's the material hymen. Right. But at the same time, it's completely only makes sense within the symbolic imaginary. Social meaning. Right. Social meaning. So they sort of work together. And <clears throat> what he says here, which is really kind of interesting, is that he's basically inferring the fact that there's a supplement. He calls it a supplement. Mm. And he says the supplement is that space where those two of them meet. So it's not material and it's not imaginary. It's supplementary. Right. In other words, neither of them by themselves are enough. Mm -hmm. Just the material fact of the hymen mm -hmm. doesn't actually do anything in terms of you know, the idea of virginity. <clears throat> and just the idea of the virgin mm -hmm. has, has it, no it needs some grounding <laughs> in physical reality, material reality, mm -hmm. and virginity needs some grounding in imaginary right. reality, right. as it were. Mm -hmm. Of course, that supplement is very much the Lacanian mm -hmm. real. It's that piece of gum stuck to your shoe that you can't <laughs> get rid of that yet contains the full meaning of it. Right. And he makes a really extraordinary jump. A slightly perverted jump, no, very perverted, <laughs> which is that he he sort of jumps, and Derrida is aware of this, because mm -hmm. Derrida writes mm -hmm. about this, from virginity and the supplement, the imaginary being the supplement of virginity, mm -hmm. to autoeroticism, auto mm -hmm. to masturbation. Mm -hmm. Because this is kind of funny. So Rousseau, not unlike other writers of the time, mm -hmm. is very much against masturbation. And he says masturbation corrupts nature. But here's what's kind of interesting about it. Mm. He's not saying that masturbation is against nature because it doesn't serve procreation. Right. Like he's not That's saying a classical sort of conservative Catholic. Right. Like exactly. If you're going to do it, you have to make babies and mm -hmm. etc. That's not what Rousseau is doing at all. He's still very much in this logic between the material and the imaginary, because he says as soon as the body realizes as the person like me uh -huh. realizes that I don't need sex, right. my natural urge, because I can supplement uh -huh. sex by right. means of masturbation. Yeah. At that point, I've basically created it where I enjoy the masturbation more than the sex. Well, it's like a short circuit. Yeah. And that's the problem for him uh -huh. because to, in today's day and age there's very much this like politically correct idea that like everyone should learn to masturbate because mm -hmm. it'll make you more appreciate your <laughs> your, your own sexuality yeah. and your partner and if you know how to pleasure yourself you can pleasure other people yeah. and russo is totally <laughs> against this like because for russo the idea is that to to give pleasure to participate in sex mm -hmm. you don't have to know how to pleasure yourself mm -hmm. in other words pleasuring yourself is something that will put you in a short circuit, as you put it, mm. between the material and the imaginary. Right. Because it's similar to virginity in the sense, mm -hmm. right? We have physical hymen virginity mm -hmm. versus the social, social construct, construct ideal virginity. Right. But then if we realize that all we needed was the material part, mm -hmm. it would break down. Right. And that's what he's saying with, with masturbation. He's mm -hmm. saying, if we just go to the material base part, mm -hmm. the physical reality that I don't need sex because I can pleasure myself. Right then the relationship breaks down. And this is something that Zizek has actually written about as well mm -hmm. in a totally different way. Because one of the main ideas that Lacan has about human sexuality, mm -hmm. or, or less acknowledged mm -hmm. actually, is that it's not that we use the fantasy mm -hmm. 
in order to have proper sex, mm -hmm. right? So the classic idea is that you can have sex mm -hmm. as long as you have a fantasy, mm -hmm. okay. right? So yeah. sex is the real thing. Like sex <laughs> is the most important part. Like real sex with a person yeah. is the, has primacy as right. it were. Mm -hmm. And we have supplementary fantasies right. that can help us along the way. Right. Well, that we talked about like the distinction between like perversion and, um, prostitution i suppose we weren't quite so clear about that but perversion is separating like the act with all the trappings of the act the social significance of the sexual encounter so if you want to do a riff on perversion let's do it okay let's no no it. no More i briefly. didn't i didn't want to sidetrack you too no no, much. no i want you to too that's fine okay perversion <laughs> right stick with us on the material versus the imaginary right 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 so there's two types of perversion mm -hmm. between Freud and Lacan. Right. And they help us explain this. For Freud, perversion is strictly speaking a sexual activity that goes against the norm. Right. And this doesn't have to be a bad thing, mm -hmm. but there's a societal norm and you do something that is not considered part of that norm. Ergo, it's perverted. Right. A pretty straightforward definition of perversion. Mm -hmm. And Lacan flips this a little bit on its head. Mm. Because Lacan doesn't disagree with Freud. Of mm -hmm. course, he never really disagrees with <laughs> Freud. But he says, perversion isn't just doing something that is against the social mores. Mm -hmm. Perversion is the fact that you are aroused by the fact that other people disapprove. So, for example, let's say that you do something that is taboo right. privately. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, whatever. Like, I'm going to, like, people... <laughs> I'm going to pee on people or something, right? Whatever, yeah. whatever works for you. And that only is enjoyable because it's a taboo. And it's a taboo because most people think it's not normal sexuality. But if you lived in a society where suddenly that was normal, then that might no longer a be a taboo, but more importantly, would no longer be a source of arousal. Yeah. Right. And what, of course, Lacan, where he goes even further here. Right is that he's basically suggesting that this is how all sexuality functions. Mm -hmm. Because, hear me out, if you're not aroused by, again, this is very vulgar, <laughs> I apologize, if you're not just aroused by peeing on your partner, mm -hmm. but you're aroused by the fact that an imaginary other disapproves, right. at that point, the primacy of your arousal mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the material reality of your partner right. and has everything to do with the symbolic order with yeah, the imaginary. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we've shifted, right? We shifted here in the exact opposite direction from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Right. Because Rousseau says what, what happens is that when we realize that we can go in the material base world mm -hmm. of masturbation, we no longer need sex. <laughs> and Lacan says it's the other way around. Right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So end of riff on perversion <laughs> for a moment. And what's, what's important to note here is that because I want to make sure that we keep it in the argument Yeah. a little bit. Yes. So, okay, everybody's still with me? Excellent. So, <laughs> I'm sort of like thinking, trying to think, like it was such a long riff, because we did, so, um, Marx, briefly. Mm -hmm. Remember, we talked about virginity existing in the ideal mm -hmm. and in the material, material. world. Right. We talked about perversion and playing around with that. One of the things I'm going and to... being about the social construct as well. Yeah. That's a, the other key element. And so one of the things that we're we're gonna have to struggle with here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about like what comes first, the fantasy <laughs> or the body. Right. And most people, this is where we were before, mm -hmm. most people say sex between mm -hmm. two breathing people is the natural thing, has primacy. Mm -hmm. That's what we do as a species, and fantasy underlies it. So mm -hmm. The fancy we have in our head sustains what we can do with the body. Now, from a Zizek Lacanian perspective, mm -hmm. it's of course, and you can guess where we're going, the <laughs> other way around. What if it's the body, mm -hmm. the lump of flesh, mm -hmm. the thing, the material thing mm -hmm. that sustains the fantasy? In other words, we don't need sexual fantasy to sustain living, breathing, actual sex, mm -hmm. what if we need the body, the physical stand-in to sustain the fantasy? Mm -hmm. And of course, the immediate thing you'll think about here mm -hmm. is the idea of a sex doll. Right. 
because a sex doll is, in a sense, the logical conclusion of that. What mm -hmm. if you took the material thing in the world and you made that not the primary object, but you made that the, the means to an end? Right. And now you understand fully what Jean-Jacques Rousseau's problem is, mm -hmm. because he says that as soon as you embrace um, <clears throat> masturbation mm -hmm. as I'm just going to have the material part, right. you can't actually get away from the fantasy part. Mm -hmm. And so now you've taken the material and you've said the fantasy is that it is no longer meaningful. meaningful I can right? It's supplement. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> and this is the danger of supplement. And he makes a really weird transition here. Mm. Be and this is like a Lord of the Rings transition. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the warning. <laughs> yeah. Lord of the Rings transition coming up. Um, in Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. there are, of course, like elves and people and dwarves right and how are the dwarves usually depicted in lord of the rings short and hairy and but like what are their psychological traits sorry oh. I didn't their psychological traits. greedy greedy okay yeah um like how do they come across not very nice is that unfair for me to not I know it's not nice. very specific. I don't know where you're going. Okay, sorry. I realize I'm like the leading question here. Um, the dwarves in Lord of the Rings uh -huh. are not only greedy, but they have a certain gold madness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They're 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 aroused, they're titillated by wealth right. in terms of gold and what exists in the earth, and mm -hmm. they mine that wealth, mm -hmm. and they don't use that wealth like they don't use the gemstones. Mm -hmm. To buy anything in the world. Yeah. The gemstones themselves. It's not it's to an end. It's an end in itself. Yeah. That's what they desire. That mm -hmm. is what it means to be a dwarf is mm -hmm. to find a pleasure in the, the, whatever you find in the mine mm -hmm. that is bigger than any pleasure that you can get out in the world. Yeah. Um, and here, like in a very Hegelian Marxist way, remember for Hegel, one of the aphorisms is substance is subject. In mm -hmm. other words, for Hegel, object is subject subject mm -hmm. is object mm -hmm. and marx does this too because one of marx's key ideas mm -hmm. is that he's saying that what capital does right is that capital takes money mm -hmm. and it says money mm -hmm. is no longer a means of exchange mm -hmm. money is no longer just something that facilitates the movement trade. of goods and trade between people money the object of money becomes subjectivized mm -hmm. So much so that Marx even writes, he, in some ways, writing about shoes, and it's almost like he's predicting Nike sneakers. Mm -hmm. Like he's writing about shoes and he's saying the shoes are treated as if they had mouths and could speak. Mm -hmm. We've taken objects, commodities, and we've turned them into subjects. We desire them. Mm -hmm. Of course, you'll see the link here again to virginity and to sexuality. Mm -hmm. We want commodities that are untouched. We mm -hmm. want commodities that are unspoiled. Right. Uh, of course, secondhand shopping is taking <laughs> off now. Uh, but that's another riff. Yeah. <laughs> and we treat them as if they were people. Mm -hmm. We imbue them with subjectivity, in a sense. Yes. And so this is, of course, what the dwarves in Lord of the Rings do mm -hmm. is when they have like the Arkenstone or whatever, mm -hmm. like they're not going to use the Arkenstone <laughs> to buy anything. Like right. they love the Arkenstone more than they would ever love a human being. And this is the masturbatory autoeroticism mm -hmm. of the Arkenstone. Mm -hmm. And like if you go back and watch Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, mm -hmm. like especially towards the end, like it's really perverted. And the only kind of perversion where you see this, hmm. the link here, is cooking shows. <laughs> Watch Jamie Oliver or Nigella Lawson. Nigella Lawson especially. The way yeah. in which they treat food <laughs> is like how it's dwarves... It's so pornographic. It's so pornographic. <laughs> and what makes it pornographic is that cooking... You just have ingredients and you chop them up and it's the bounty of the earth and it tastes really good. But what's the one thing that's missing on a cooking show? Mm. Of course, it's taste and smell. Right. Two things. You can't taste or smell the food on a mm -hmm. cooking show. Mm -hmm. And so what a cooking show has to do is it has to sell the arousal, the titillation of eating by means of supplementing it. By imbuing it in the object itself. Which is why there's no cooking show where there isn't also tasting and eating. The yeah. tasting and eating always has to be a part of the cooking show. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just like... It's just a total simulation. Yeah. And and But even further, right? Mm -hmm. If you took away the tasting and eating part, mm. 
at what point is the meat like a juicy mm -hmm. close up of a steak being squished? Is of course pornographic <laughs> at that point as well. Like there's a reason people call it food porn. Mm -hmm. And it's not food porn because you're sexually aroused, but it's because it's that same so remember that supplementary point between the imaginary part and the material part. Yep. And when that short circuits, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes excessive. That's when it becomes a supplement. That's when it becomes a form of autoeroticism. Right. And so the dwarves in the Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. when they have the Arkenstone, mm -hmm. and you go to Peter Jackson's mm -hmm. movie of it, the, they're lustful. Like they're they're cooing and they're caressing and they're mm -hmm. rumbling. Mm -hmm. And they do this really gross thing, which is if you've ever seen somebody with their pet and it's not your pet and like Ugh, uh, it's, pet, it's like it's totally disgusting like the way people the way people do that with their pets and that's what the and the thing is we we don't think of pets as objects so we're sort of okay with it mm -hmm. but that's exactly what thorin does with the arkenstone mm -hmm. oh my mm -hmm. precious blah, blah, blah. and that and that to leap or Gollum with or, the ring. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what mm -hmm. Gollum does. And mm -hmm. in this lecture series, we've talked about how the ring is, in a sense, that pure empty space of human potentiality. Right. And what you can do with that power is two things. If you have the power of the ring, mm -hmm. you can either use it to create and destroy. Mm -hmm. You have like this pure Faustian power mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make the world around you. Right. Or the logical conclusion and the opposite of that mm -hmm. is, of course, that it only serves your own pleasure. It becomes autoeroticism. And that is the boundary that Lord of the Rings understands really mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Jean-Jacques Rousseau has in mind when he talks about masturbation. He says, here's this enormous natural power mm -hmm. to create and destroy, which is to have children, right? right? Negation and creation in human form. Yeah. Or go home and masturbate, <laughs> which is having that power mm -hmm. and enjoying the fact that that power is mine, that I can just revel in it. Right. And that's Gollum's ring. Yeah. Right? Gollum doesn't do anything. Like Gollum <laughs> doesn't want to rule the world. Gollum wants to have autoeroticism. Yeah. And what's terrifying about that, and this is exactly what Jean-Jacques Rousseau understands, is that if you go to that autoerotic place, mm -hmm. you are Gollum in a cave. You don't need the world. Right. You don't need eyesight, you don't need skin, you don't need anything. Mm -hmm. All you need is that pure id, that pure expression of your lustful intent. All right. And of course, <clears throat> in Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. the dwarves are the species who have that as a driving force. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what every dwarf wants is to be left alone in a cave <laughs> to caress whatever object they have in mm -hmm. that cave, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. This is also where, like, I don't want to do a riff on this, but like anti-Semitic narratives mm -hmm. of like Jews and Jews being obsessed with money and yeah. et cetera. They, they tended to, even in Wagner, the anti-Semitic trope of like Mimi, et cetera. Yeah. It's very much the hunch over Gollum like figure who is caressing, caressing the, the thing. Yeah. And the point here is that the, the worshiping of Mammon, the, mm -hmm. the, the, is a corruption of the natural means, mm -hmm. but that's a Marxist idea. Right. Because Marx is already saying, if you take money, mm -hmm. which is the means to an exchange, mm -hmm. and you make it an autoerotic substance, mm -hmm. you subjectivize it, yes. you turn it into a ring, then you've subverted yeah. that by means of supplementing it. Mm -hmm. In other words, you no longer need the exchange. You no longer need other people. Mm -hmm. All you need is your hoard and you lying on your money. It's the potential of exchange. It's not the exchange itself. Yeah. And that short circuit is what Marx calls capital, basically. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm ranting a bit here, but thanks for still being with me. Does that make sense so far? I think? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to briefly go back to Dostoevsky. And it's going to be worth your while. So don't like immediately leave the class. Because like, <laughs> this is something, that's probably my favorite passage. Mm. No, I don't have a favorite. But... <laughs> So in Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. there's basically... This is still Brothers Karamazov, right? Yeah, Brothers okay. Karamazov. So in Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, there is a sort of a philosophical aside. Because Dostoevsky often does this. Like, he writes like a miniature essay in the actual book. Mm -hmm. And this one is, Dostoevsky basically says, why... No, he's not even saying why. He's just positing. He's saying a realist, mm -hmm. someone who's a realist, is exactly, precisely the person who believes in miracles. <laughs> 
So <clears throat> we think for a moment, wait, this doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Like a realist is someone who doesn't believe in miracles, right? Right. Says, I have to see something in order to believe it. Mm-hmm. And Dostoevsky says, no, it's the realists who really believe in miracles. Mm-hmm. And here's how that works. I'm going to take a sip of water. It's like I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I don't want you to. Yeah, it's really dry. Um, hydration, Jack. Hydration's key. Coffee is not hydration. Should I go on my riff? Okay. Go for it. <clears throat> so why does a realist mm-hmm. believe in miracles more than someone who's not a realist? Mm. And Dostoevsky says it works like this. A realist says the highest thing in my world, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the most important thing in my world, is that I can fact check it. That I can see it. I have to see it in order to believe it. Right. And this is the the my intellect, my capacity to think logically, mm-hmm. is the foundation of the world. This is what a realist will mm-hmm. believe, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> and then imagine for a moment that a realist is confronted with a bona fide miracle. Mm-hmm. So something that cannot be explained according to any kind of logical system. Mm-hmm. The realist has a choice, Mm -hmm. which is not really just. And the choice is either I stop being a realist Mm -hmm. and I say, I'm no longer a realist. I now believe in miracles. Mm -hmm. Or, and this is exactly what the realist is going to do, or the realist says, I'm going to integrate, sorry, I'm losing my eyes. I'm going to integrate miracles into my realist worldview. Into my worldview, yeah. In other Mm -hmm. words, now I have to be ethically committed to being a realist to the point where my theory of the world Mm -hmm. of the realist world takes miracles into account yeah because i think that's an interesting point the notion that what the realist really desires is also a systemic um sort of organized coherent view of the world and they say the only way to deal with something that doesn't fit in with that yeah. is to change their framework to suddenly include miracles rather yeah. than say well you know it was just a fluke or it was yeah. a coincidence or just dismiss it in that sense but to then reorient their framework to allow for these exceptions yeah yeah you're exactly you know? right yeah it's just really dry air today <laughs> um if the real you're exactly right if the realist finds something that is inconsistent with his worldview, right. being a realist means <laughs> that he has to come up with a logical system that includes that which cannot be thought. Right. Includes Where, the miracle. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Whereas someone who isn't a realist, someone mm-hmm. who's a believer or a doubter or a faithful, mm-hmm. will see a miracle and be like, okay. It's just another, I guess that happened. Another thing. Yeah. Another thing I can't explain. I'm surrounded by things I can't explain. It's just one more thing. He doesn't have to make it part of a system. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, that's why the realist mm-hmm. is for Dostoevsky the fundamentalist, mm-hmm. because rather than change his mind, right. he will make the facts fit his own theory. Right. So a miracle will have to be reintegrated. Mm -hmm. And this is the ethical consistency of the realist, which Mm -hmm. is that he would rather live in a world in which miracles are accounted for (laughs) than to cross over into the non-rational world. Yeah. And this is to leap back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau here. Mm -hmm. This is how we have to understand his somewhat confusing expression that uh, reason is a scandal. Mm -hmm. Reason is like the scandal of nature. Reason is the scandal of nature. Yeah. Reason is scandalous. (laughs) And the reason reason is scandalous Mm -hmm. is because reason wants to make everything fit into a system. Mm -hmm. But that system has to be grounded in a certain amount of fantasy, Mm -hmm. right? We already proved prove that with the idea of like virginity being with material and thought. Mm -hmm. So the scandal of reason, my friends, Mm -hmm. the scandal underlying all reason and Dostoevsky knew this is that reason relies on the imaginary. Mm -hmm. That is the scandal. That is the secret underlying rationality and reason is that it has a grounding in the imaginary, in the Mm non-rational and that that excessive part is fundamental to it because if you don't have the imaginary grounding, and you just have the pure material reason, like where are the hooks made mm-hmm. or what is this door right. to reference the beginning of this lecture, mm-hmm. then 
you've perverted reason into total fantasy mm -hmm. in the same way that for masturbation, if you detach masturbation from the fantasy, you have a perversion of what masturbation is for. Right. So it's point. that excessive element that's crucial. Yeah. It's that thing that doesn't fit the system mm -hmm. that is the necessary ingredient. So you're saying that the, that excessive element is like the miracle that, I mean, if it were like an analogy. It's the disavowed part, right? Okay. So again, we're talking about primacy here. What comes uh -huh. first? If a realist mm. has realist views mm -hmm. and he encounters a miracle mm -hmm. and then he finds a way to account for the miracle in his realist views, right. what came first? Mm -hmm. Did his realist views come first or did the miracle, the exception come first? And that's exactly the question Marx is asking mm -hmm. because Marx says there is a particular group that becomes a stand in for the universal group. Mm -hmm. In other words, the working class is the excessive element, the particular group created by the internal limitations of capitalism that embodies the unacknowledged universal. And that's something that already registers in Hegel and in mm -hmm. Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't want to press that point because we're not at the end yet. We got, 50, <laughs> we got 15 more minutes to wrap this up. <laughs> it won't make sense. Okay. Uh, let's jump from the romanticism of Rousseau <laughs> to uh, the romanticism, if you can call it that, of Rilke. Rilke. Mm, yes, thank you for pronouncing that. Nice. Rilke. The German poet. German poet yes. and author. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Rilke went through some very difficult times in his life. Mm. Very low. It's like George mm -hmm. Orwell down and out in Paris mm -hmm. and London, like mm -hmm. living amongst the social rejects and outcasts and mm -hmm. the poor and the beggars. And uh, one of the things that Rilke has a little rant. Mm. So Rilke had a beard. And he says that at a certain point, his beard is so like so uh, disheveled mm -hmm. that beggars come up to him. And instead of asking him for money, they'll try to fraternize with him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like hang out or offer him things. Yeah. And he says, there's a woman who keeps coming up to him with a pencil hmm. and she wants to talk about a pencil with him. And he's really shocked because he says like, I'd never quite realized that what's worse than seeing beggars as being separate from mm. the world. Mm -hmm. What's worse than that. What's horrific is being acknowledged by beggars. It's that moment that we talked about earlier about the, uh, Revenge of the Body Snatchers. Society is out there. Everybody's moving. Everyone's ignoring me and it's just fine. Everything, yeah. I'm alone in the world because mm -hmm. I enjoy being alone in the company of millions of others. Right. And then suddenly if all those others turn their attention towards you, <laughs> it's really freakish. And that's what Rilke experiences where he basically, his beard is so disheveled that other mm -hmm. beggars start thinking that he's a beggar. And they take pity on him. They, yeah. they think that he's a beggar more deserving of pity than yeah, they Yeah, they acknowledge him as one of their own. <laughs> yeah. And that's a really frightening point for him because he's like, oh, the point of society is that I don't have to look at beggars <laughs> and beggars don't look at me and, and beggars want my attention. But now of the way it's the other way around. Uh -huh. They think I am one of them. Uh -huh. And like, there's that inversion. And so Rilke is obsessed already here. It runs uh -huh. through his work. He's obsessed with this idea of <clears throat> where do I fit? Like, uh -huh. what is the place for me? Uh -huh. And how do I lose control over where I fit mm -hmm. because we think that we fit into society because of our autonomy and our free will. And what Rilke is already assuming here is that horrific component by which other people mm -hmm. get to decide where I fit. In other words, if beggars, if poor people on the street beggars start treating you like a beggar, mm -hmm. aren't you a beggar at that point? <laughs> And what do you do? I mean, of course, you could just groom your beard, mm -hmm. but he's scandaled. Like, he thinks this is a scandal because Rilke writes in his notes, why would I have to groom my beard? Mm. It's a free society. <laughs> I don't have to do anything with my beard. And now suddenly I have to have a shiny beard so that beggars don't think I'm a beggar. <laughs> a, a problem any college student would surely appreciate. <laughs> Wait, I have to wear pants? <laughs> And if I don't wear pants, people will think I don't have a job, etc. Right? Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> I want to do one more Rilke bit here. Okay. Because in one of Rilke's novels, mm. I'm forgetting the name here, it's a name. Mm. Um, he has a really, what to me is a really frightening passage. Mm -hmm. I find it really, really unnerving. Um, and disturbing in that same way of Dostoevsky's The Hooks Were Made Just For Me mm -hmm. or Kafka, you know, 
the as the protagonist is dying, the watchman comes over and whispers in his ears, this gate, this barrier was made just for you. Right. This thing that you thought was external that existed in the world is actually designed as your personal hell. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, which is a materialist idealist inversion, right? Mm -hmm. To use the tech link here. Mm -hmm. We go from mm -hmm. like, here's a material object in the world and we've inverted it into an idealist unfolding of being. Right. Um, Okay, so Rilke writes about this, and mm. it's it's very disgusting. Like mm. it's really it really gets me. He says there's a chair, mm -hmm. there's a certain like armchair in a because he's poor, right? He's living in like squalid circumstances, mm -hmm. but he's still upholding the illusion of not being poor. Right. So yeah, I'm surrounded by beggars, but I'm not one of them. I'm different. Mm -hmm. It's like refugees. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of refugees, for example. They don't identify as refugees. Yes. They'll say those other people in the camp are refugees, but I'm not a refugee. Mm -hmm. Now, and it's easy to mock that, but that's exactly what we do all the time. I say all those other people in SUVs <laughs> are corrupting the planet. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Like we have that cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And so Rilke is living amongst extremely poor people, right. beggars essentially, mm -hmm. in, in forms of social housing. And there's a there's an armchair that he that he sits in. Mm. But of course, because beggars are unwashed, mm. they tend to put their very dirty hair. And you can imagine just being like smelly hair, like gunky, <laughs> unwashed, like the kind of dirt where if the beggar's been in the room, you can smell it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very visceral description. Mm -hmm. And so there's a stain at the headrest of the chair, mm -hmm. like where you put your hair, there's like a brown stain. Mm -hmm. And so what he has, he has a little handkerchief, like a little pocket handkerchief that he'll put on that chair mm -hmm. so that he doesn't have to put his own head on that filthy that chair. Mm -hmm. And this is something that he does. Mm -hmm. And then Rilke writes, and this is really very haunting. Like mm -hmm. I really, I really sort of get chills when I think about this. Mm -hmm. He says he slowly comes to realize that that stain and that indentation on that chair mm -hmm was not external to him. It wasn't something put there by somebody else, mm. but that that indentation in this gross chair, as he slowly sank into it, he realized that it was made exactly for his head, mm. that his head fit like a hand in a glove, mm -hmm. that that disgusting thing mm. in the chair, as soon as he took away the handkerchief, molded around his skull as if the chair had always been waiting for him, made just for him, for mm -hmm. him to sink into. That stain of poverty fit him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He like, there's that moment of submission. Mm -hmm. It's like an mm -hmm. old person who suddenly realizes that like death is imminent. It's mm -hmm. Kafka's figure dying in front of the gate. It's right. the Dostoevsky character saying, are those hooks made just for me? Yeah. And of course, Rilke does the same thing. Mm -hmm. He says, this chair is external. It's disgusting. It's been used by other people. It has a stain on it. Mm -hmm. Everything about me mm -hmm. is the opposite of what this chair is. Mm -hmm. I can't believe in chairs if this is a chair. Right. And then there's that, that kere, there's that total inversion point, mm -hmm. which is exactly the Hegelian external obstacle being turned into its own solution, mm -hmm. which is actually this thing that I thought was an obstacle to me yeah. was made just for me. And it's that clicking into place, mm. which is of course also a metaphor for the Hegelian idealist process. Mm -hmm. Imagine a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. You end up at the same point where you started, right. but somewhere else. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. It's like when you go on a trip mm -hmm. and you come back home, mm -hmm. you never actually come back home. Home is suddenly a new place. Mm -hmm. And that's what this disgusting chair is. Mm -hmm. At the exact point where he stops resisting the chair, mm -hmm. he realizes this chair was only ever made for me. Mm -hmm. This is Nietzschean amor fati, mm -hmm. falling in love with your fate. Mm -hmm. it, it means suddenly you realize what your fate is mm -hmm. and that you click. And there's something deeply horrific about this because it's like, there's the satisfaction of a Lego block clicking into where it fits. Mm -hmm. The exact point where you click, where it's like, I fit here, right. is also the moment 
in which you've, in a sense, uh, like uh, you run out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like giving you've up. You surrendered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's important here? Why, well, it's interesting yeah. that we say surrender to your fate. You yeah. know that you that you give in to what is there for you, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. You stop fighting it. Mm -hmm. It's that point where you stop fighting it, and it's like. The reason I'm talking about this, mm -hmm. why are we talking about this? In a class, that's supposed to be about Marx. <laughs> a lot of people like to say mm -hmm. that Marx corrects Hegel mm -hmm. because Hegel exists <laughs> in a completely idealist mm -hmm. world in which everything is solipsistic. In other words, everything happens inside your head. Everything mm -hmm. is the subject. It's this holistic monster of Hegelian abstract idealism, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that Marx's innovation is to take the abstract uh, lovey-dovey Hegel <laughs> and ground him in the material world. Right. Inject realism. Now, yeah, inject realism. Mm -hmm. To some extent, that is true. Mm -hmm. Because Marx does what Hegel can't see. Mm -hmm. Hegel comes to the limits of his own system because Hegel doesn't understand how the burgeoning industrialization of the world he is living in is going to take on those very abstract qualities mm -hmm. that Hegel writes about. Mm -hmm. Hegel doesn't see that the condition for all of the unfolding of like reason mm -hmm. and spirit and all these things mm -hmm. takes place through the libidinal investment, in other words, the psychological investment mm -hmm. of objects in the world, money, mm -hmm. into commodities. Right. Like Marx, in a sense, completes what Hegel can't see but it isn't, my dear friends. Marx is not saying it's not in the ideal world, it's in the material world. Mm -hmm. Marx is saying the place where idealism unfolds mm -hmm. is in the material at the exact point that the material also reverses back into being the idealist spirit abstract substance. Right. In the same way that the Dostoevsky character is hung up on where the hook's made, mm -hmm. because that isn't just the material problem it's also the idealist problem it's the problem of his own reckoning with his personal hell mm -hmm. in the same way that kafka's portal or gate is not just the material object it's the material stand-in for the spirit the idealism of his mm -hmm. predicament mm -hmm. in the same way that we've talked about masturbation being not just the material part but the supplement etc etc and what marx is saying is that in the breakdown between the idealist abstract border and the materialist border, mm -hmm. so the investment of spirit, libidinal investment in the material, mm -hmm. is also the material investment in the libidinal. That, that collapse, yes. that confrontation, mm -hmm. and the excessive supplementary thing that comes out of it, the thing that shouldn't be there, that is the unfolding of Hegel's project. And so Marx's most serious work, which takes place after the 1848 revolutions, is when he goes back to reading Hegel's logic mm -hmm. and he starts piecing that stuff together. So what we're going to do in the next, sorry, I realize it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. We're going to do in the next two weeks, mm -hmm. we've basically set the grounding mm -hmm. for talking about what is the Hegelian thing that Hegel couldn't see. What comes after Hegel? Mm -hmm. What is the role of nothingness in a post-Hegelian landscape? Right. And that's what we're going to develop in the final two classes, mm -hmm. being the class after this one and the class after that one. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is there anything you want to... No, that's great. That's cool. Sensitive. Wonderful. That was oh, a big one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, yes. for watching. Before we wrap up, I just want to say, if you're joining us for the very first time, Welcome to our learning community. Yes. Uh, we teach, or I teach, mm -hmm. two classes every week. One advanced class, which is the Monday class, mm -hmm. the one you've just witnessed right now. I also teach a beginner's class every Friday at 11 a.m. USA Pacific on TikTok. I see you on TikTok. Thank you for watching on TikTok. <laughs> and um, you can go to our Substack page. Yeah. Where that's we, where we're trying to compile everything. Yeah, so that's where we can reach you. If you don't know where to, to go, go to Substack. Yeah, Substack, link in bio. And right now, dear friends, <laughs> as in right now, we are going to move over yes. to the Clubhouse app in which we're going to see you. We're going to see you. We're going to see you. <laughs> 
And not only see you, because we're not going to see you there, we're going to hear you because <laughs> on Clubhouse, we're going to have an audio seminar, yes. which Jenlene is going to moderate, <laughs> at, in them. which we can but talk yes. about this class mm -hmm. and think about how we want to move forward as a learning community. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want an invite to Clubhouse, please DM us on Instagram. Uh, thank you again to everyone who has sent out invites and um, offered their invitations. It's really helped us out a lot. So we're going to be doing Clubhouse for the next hour. Mm -hmm. um, it only works on iPhones at the moment. So if you have an Android, you have to wait for the app to be available on Android. Sorry about that. I know that's the worst. I know that's frustrating. It's because they're still in testing, uh, but it should happen soon. Uh, we don't have a room yet, but we're going to set it up. We're going to set up a club. If you follow at Sublime Hysteric, at Sublime Hysteric, that is me. What is a Sublime Hysteric? That is Lacan's way of describing Hegel for the nerds out there. <laughs> at Sublime Hysteric is me. And Jenlene is at Jenlene. Jenlene. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all right. are out. We shall see you soon. Thanks we love everyone you all. for bye joining. Bye. Take care. Have a great week. Oh, let's close all these. Yeah, at Sublime Hysteric. Perfect. Okay, we are going to go to the... Uh,